Coming up on today's Unscripted Faith, what does it mean to be resilient? Resilience is something we can all use, but how do we find it when we face setbacks and heartaches? Both of our guests today have faced immense trials that most people couldn't even imagine. You're going to hear their stories of how they were able to see the good in it and bounce back. All that and more coming up right now on Unscripted Faith. So glad you guys joined us for today's Unscripted Faith. You know, I really think, Jay, today we're going to walk away a little bit stronger, a little bit tougher, and a lot more resilient. <laughs> you know, a lot of people are going through a lot of different things. People are going through trials and tribulations, yeah. and I think both of our guests have the ability to kind of give us some insight on how yes. we can bounce back and even bounce forward yes. in life and then not just survive, but to be able to thrive. Come on with it. That's Come what on. we need. Listen, our first guest knows exactly what it takes to be resilient. Donna Gibbs has walked through her fair share of darkness and loss in her own life, and now she's helping others who are going through similar battles. Donna, we are so glad to have you on Unscripted Faith. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. Yes, we're glad to have you. Now listen, resilience, everybody wants it, but it doesn't come easily. Can you walk mm. us through in about maybe a two or three minute story of telling us how you came into your greatest resilience? Oh gosh, that's a loaded question, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm reminded that anytime we go through a storm, um, there were things that were going on in our life prior to that. There are things that we encounter in the middle of a storm, and then there's things that we move through afterwards. I've certainly been through my fair share of struggles, um, and I, I know some of those things of my past we were probably planning on talking about today, but the most recent one that I find is relevant is that my community here in Western North Carolina is um, actually devastated right now wow. um, with the effects of Hurricane Helene. And I know many of your viewers may not see all those details through the media, but um, it is like something I've never seen in my lifetime, a 1,000 year storm that has hit our hills and our valleys. And, um, and so, so many, many of our people are wondering that same question that you've just asked, that how do we have resilience through this? And I'm just reminded that much of resilience just depends on the coping skills that we're using. I know that that's a part of my story. Where am I leaning? Where am I going to when I'm anxious and stressed and traumatized? Um, but it's also moving through. We live in a culture of comforts, and you don't have to look far through our economy to see that so much of our resources just go to being comfortable. Um, certainly our people now um, are much less than comfortable, um, you know, a couple of months without fresh water, many still living in tents, and it was a long time to access food and basic, basic necessities of life. But in our culture, we spend a lot of money for comfort, and that actually trips us up when we face a trial of life because there's some situations that we can't escape, so we are left trying to numb it. And as we do that, as we numb it with whatever else you be, you know, it's an addiction-related thing um, or something new that we buy, um, alcohol, boy, what a great numbing agent, but also a depressant keeps us stuck. All of those things that we could reach to actually keep us stuck in our suffering. They prevent our resilience. As we think about resilience God's way, we know that it is moving through a valley, not around a valley, which means that we have to experience some distress in that. We have very little tolerance of distress. And as a professional counselor, I know that much of what we're seeing as people move through suffering is that their distress tolerance actually increases. And that's what some resilience looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and as, as I said before, we don't actually bounce back. My goodness, Western North Carolina, there are communities that are wiped away. I, I mean, literally, those communities don't, they're not there anymore. Not even any remnant of some of those homes and residential areas and businesses. Um, so they're not going to bounce back. But I believe it is God's way that we bounce forward. And I'm reminded in that scripture in Isaiah 43, as it is God speaking and he says, forget the former things. 
do not keep focusing on the past stuff. And he says, see, I'm doing a new thing. And that is the message that I keep speaking to our community here. Let's not just focus on what was because that's going to keep us stuck. We've got to be paying attention to what God is doing, a new thing, because he goes on in that scripture later and says, do you not perceive it? Almost asking the question, are you going to miss it? Because if we're always focusing on what was and whatever that was, you know, for us, for it's for us, it's our communities. What was what we remember, um, the places we used to enjoy being, where our families lived. If we focus only on that, we will not move past the point of pain. And certainly it is raw here. We're only two months past Hurricane Helene. Um, there's a season of time when it is it is okay to just be raw in your pain and to wonder why um, David and the Psalms never, ever, ever tried to sugarcoat that. But we can also hold these things together. Yes, I am in deep pain and anguish and grief and I'm confused and I don't understand. Along with God is capable of doing a new thing. And here's times when I've seen evidence of his hand in my life in the past. Here's the character of God that I know is true, even when I can't quite formulate it or understand it in my present circumstance. And that's just how simple and messy and difficult mm -hmm. resilience is. We're moving through an unthinkable season. Well, you know, Donna, one of the things that I, I've always felt whenever tragedy hits, um, it's important that we get the mind of the Lord uh, because, you know, everybody hits, hits troubling times. Obviously, what you guys are going through, I mean, that's devastating. How have you captured the mind of Christ that you're able to comprehend the new thing in the midst of the devastation you guys are walking through? Yeah, you know, I think that is just holding on to the character of God, that we know that he is for us, that his plans are not to harm us. That is confusing at times, but I, you know, as, as a counselor, I focus a lot on our thoughts. Our thoughts yeah. are perhaps the most influential part of our resilience. I call it the most important conversation no one ever heard because you don't necessarily have to speak it out loud, but the thoughts that you're ruminating on will directly impact your emotions and your behavioral responses. And so if we're wondering, are my thoughts healthy? Let's align it with God's word. And that's why it's so essential to be in the word. I realize when we're going through a trial of life, something that is really challenging to survive, it's hard for us to even concentrate. And so it might just be one verse at a time that you are dwelling on and you're just sitting there and you're allowing that to filter through um, some of the destructive thoughts that you might be having. You know, and some here, some of the thoughts that they might be having is this is never going to get better. This is as good as it's ever going to be. Um, I, I'm never going to feel hope again. You know, these things like that. And so we challenge those thoughts and we sit on truth and we repeat it and we meditate on, on it often over and over and over again. And that's not an easy task. Like you said, it's not that you're escaping the pain of the moment. You're in the middle of it and you're having to declare these things, you know. Um, so absolutely. go ahead. I, I was just going to say, you know, th th another part of my story is that I spent three months in a hospital bed and with a physical battle of my life. That was way prior to Helene. Um, but one of those things, I, I learned a lot of coping skills. I remember my physician saying, you're going to have to use every coping skill you've ever, ever given to anybody else. But one of the most important ones was being able to pay attention to what I call reverse gratitude, areas that I am thankful for, evidence that I can see of God's hand, even in the midst of this tremendous pain, because it is both. Yes, very, very painful a great deal of struggle there, but I noticed I could be thankful for um, people who brought in a Christmas tree yeah. <laughs> or meals or um, conversation or the mattress underneath me that I don't know how they did this, but I never had a bed sore. And so just dwelling on those things that you wouldn't normally be thankful for but it will change the brain. And when you change the brain, you change how you cope through trials of life. And that's what we see in the Psalms. 
over and over, David would just lay out how really hard it was. It was legitimately hard. He had enemies. He had physical challenges. He didn't know. How many times did he say, like, basically, God, are you paying attention? How much longer are you going to leave me in this? But we could also see a shift. And you can almost feel the emotional shift for him because he would stop and say, but these things I remember. And he would instruct his soul. There was one point in there he said, but I instructed my soul. Mm -hmm. And if you're going through a trial of life, don't be passive with your thoughts. It could be the most influential factor in making sure that they are aligned with the mind of Christ. And you won't know that unless you are in his word. And it may, again, it may be one verse at a time, but that's all you can concentrate on. Wow. That hyper concentration on gratitude, those small things can make all the difference. Donna, thank you so much for your story and thank you for helping to build resilience in us. We're praying for you guys. Yes. Thank you so much. We appreciate your prayers. Thank you. We're now going to check out this week's Ask Amy as she offers some advice for anyone who is feeling overwhelmed. Let's take a look. Today's Ask Amy really um, hits my heart personally today. This question is from a friend, Pastor Amy, I'm going through chemotherapy and I'm almost done with treatments, but I'm still not feeling my best. My mom needs full-time assistance and my brother can't help her, so really it's all on me. I still have my job and my boss has been really gracious and understanding. Help. I'm overwhelmed. Wow. And I just thought there's so much going on here. And I want to let you know that we are committing to hold you up in our prayers and ask God to strengthen you and to strengthen your arms for this battle that you're in. You are in a battle and I do believe that you will win. You know, I'm going to ask you two questions that might seem strange, but these are questions that a mentor asks my husband and I all the time. Number one, where are you at? Number two, who are you with? It's like, what? I'm overwhelmed. I need help. Well, hold on just a minute. Where are you? What rooms are you in? Are you in church hearing the word? Are you in a life group surrounded by people of faith that are caring for you and praying for you? And, and who are you with? You can't do life alone. This is not the time for you to be isolated. You need brothers and sisters. You need them to be praying for you, helping you, checking in on you, and helping bear the load and the burden for you. Where are you at and who are you with? John 14, 27 says this, Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled. Do not be afraid. Man, let that sink deep into your heart today. Mark 4, 39, Jesus rose up and he rebuked the wind and, and he said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And right now there's a storm going on in your life. Rise up and say, peace, be still in Jesus' name. Philippians 4, 7 says, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. So I just want to take a minute as we're finishing this, and I just want to pray for you. I want to pray for anybody that feels overwhelmed, that you need help. There is struggles, trials. You feel like right now you're in a perfect storm. Father, I come before you right now, and I just pray for my brother and my sister. And God, I ask right now, peace be still. We speak to that storm and we say, you be still in Jesus' name. God, I thank you. You strengthen their arms, that you equip them for every battle that they're facing today. And God, I thank you that they will receive the peace that you give. My peace I give to you, Jesus said. And God, I thank you today they receive that peace in their mind of the tormenting thoughts. We say, peace be still in Jesus' name. And we also speak health and life and healing to every part of your body right now. And we believe that by his stripes, you are healed in Jesus' name. Amen. We're praying for you. We love you. And we're believing God's best for you.
Well, our next guest can relate to what Pastor Amy just shared. When Phil Zilke was just 22 years old, he was given devastating news that shook his world. Phil, welcome to Unscripted Faith. Thank you. It's great to be here today. Great to be with you. Uh, age 22, I mean, we're, we're hearing the different stories of what happened down in the Carolinas, and uh, now you hear about Ask Amy and people dealing with cancerous diagnosis. You have been in those shoes. Tell us from your perspective, how did you navigate during that time when you got that stage four Hodgkin lymphoma diagnosis? Honestly, when I was first diagnosed, not very well, but I had to learn to really grow my faith as I was going through those difficult times. I was diagnosed with stage four cancer at age 22. It was on the two year dating anniversary to my girlfriend, Carrie. Wow. And uh, that next day when I was diagnosed, I ended up in the hospital. It was the first time in my life that life stood still. I struggled. I had to uh, be present with myself and my circumstances, didn't have the influence of my friends anymore, um, didn't have the, the influences of the media, things that were maybe negatively uh, impacting me. And so I spent six, six months on my hospital bed and did chemotherapy. By the time that was done, doctors said I was cancer free and I went to become a fourth grade teacher, started the school year late. Kids were really excited for me to be at class, You know, the nine and 10 year olds coming in First of all, I'm a male. It's like you can walk on water just by walking in the classroom. <laughs> and uh, I ended up teaching from September until April. Then I got these pains in my hips again. And that's where the cancer was attached to my bones the first time. But uh, now, once I was re-diagnosed, I had to deliver news not to my girlfriend, but to my fiance, Carrie, because we were three months away from our wedding. Really difficult to be able to share those news with that news with people. Went through it for a whole other year, the chemotherapy, stem cell transplant, radiation, and really, uh, the way that I was able to stay strong in my faith and navigate those waters is by letting go, letting go of my own will and surrendering myself fully to the Lord. And when you go through difficult times um, and you're struggling, you can really have those fruits of the spirit of peace and joy and patience and uh, kindness and goodness and self-control. And for me, it came down to the sickest times on my hospital bed. When I was during my stem cell transplant, I was hooked up to tubes on oxygen. My body was completely gray, and I couldn't have a sip of water for about a month and a half because I had such bad sores up and down my esophagus. And that's when I hit my breaking point. And I said, Lord, I believe Jesus died for me. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to be in this pain anymore, but if it's not my time, I promise to dedicate the rest of my life to you and what you have planned for me. And so I kept a journal the whole time of what people did for me. About a week after I was diagnosed, a group of people put a care package together for me. They all signed their names to it. They said they were thinking about me and praying for me. It caused me to break down and cry. I could have cared less about those things before, but now that I knew I wasn't going to be alone, I was going to learn about the importance of prayer, and I learned it was okay to accept other people's help. It gave me the strength to continue to move forward. And then when I was well enough to be at home, I'd lay upstairs on the couch in my, my empty house. Uh, my parents were at work. My younger siblings were at school. And I looked forward to when it was 1 o'clock. Uh, why 1 o'clock? Because that's when the mailman came. And so I'd work my energy out to the ed edge of the couch, make my way down the stairs, out to the front door to see if someone remembered me. And every single week for two years, I pulled a card out with my name on it. And so even though that journey from upstairs to downstairs could wear me out for that day, once I had that card of encouragement in my hand, it gave me the strength to go back up those stairs again. And so I'd sit down, I'd open the card. It was always the right message at exactly the right time, as if God personally put that letter into the mailbox uh, himself. And then when I was in the hospital room, one day I woke up and my grandfather was sitting in the corner of the room. He, had, uh, he was a lifelong pastor and teacher and evangelist. And he said, Phil, I'd gone to your house. I grabbed your Bible, which was on the shelf, and I highlighted all the verses with hope and strength and peace. He read those aloud to me. Then he came over to my bedside, got down about eye level and said, Phil, I got to tell you something. Your grandma and I, we love you. But most importantly, your heavenly father does. Put the Bible on my nightstand and he walked out. And when I couldn't have visitors or didn't want visitors, God's word is where I got my strength from. And so I really learned though during those times in my hospital bed and no matter someone's going through cancer or a certain illness or a difficult family situation, uh, we believe fully uh, that God is the same yesterday, today and forever. And so I look at the promises, especially in James 4, 8, that says, when I draw near to you, you'll draw near to me. And uh, so that's a, that's a blessing just to know that uh, every time we draw near to God, he's going to draw near to us. So when we're walking through a storm or a difficult time, it's like we can put our hand out. He puts his hand inside of ours and we walk through that storm together. 
You know, Phil, one quick question I have for you as well. When you walked through all that, we heard uh, Donna just talked about how a lot of times when life is crumbling around us, God is actually doing a new thing. Did you see, now looking back, or maybe while you were in it, did you see God's new thing? What was he talking to you about coming out of it or while you were in it to come out of it? Well, while I was going through that, first of all, in the beginning, I just thought, okay, I can do this on my own strength. And then as I was going through, I realized I can't. I have to surrender that. And so we look at Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And so I kept a journal of what people did for me the entire time I was sick. And once I uh, promised and gave my life fully to the Lord, I started setting these bite-sized goals. One day I just wanted to get out of bed by myself. Eventually I'd make it out in the hallway with my IV pole and a nurse or family member by my side. And I'd set my sights on that very first doorway. And so my, my day one goal was to get to the first door, day two to get to the second door. Eventually, I'd make my way all the way around that hallway. And I saw kids and I saw adults who had nobody. And I knew during this time that God was having me go through this journey so I can relate to a lot of other people that are going through these difficult circumstances of cancer and how we can help people and bring God's love to them, Christ-centered support to them while they're going through this disease. Wow. I mean, I just love how... That, that hope of having the card in the mailbox mm -hmm. was what got you through day by day and you'd go and get it and bring it up. And that is something that, you know, people, I think a lot of times we underestimate the power of our simple gestures, but your living testimony of breathing out and causing others, calling others into those simple gestures. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing and how we can also do that for those who are suffering around us. Sure. So this year alone, 2 million Americans will be diagnosed with cancer. They say uh, in our lifetime, one in three women and one in two men will be diagnosed. And so what I felt called to do was to support people in Christ-centered ways, the same way that people supported me through the care package, through cards of hope, uh, through prayer, through visits, through sharing the gospel with people. And so our mission at Phil's Friends is to provide Christ-centered support and hope to people going through cancer. You can go to our website, philsfriends.org, which is P-H-I-L-S, friends. Dot org, and you can request a care package for anybody that you know going through cancer throughout the United States, whether they're in Florida or Texas or Idaho. If you go to our website, put in your information as the requester and theirs as the patient. We have volunteers and hope centers uh, across the country that decorate the outside of these boxes. They put a Bible in there, a journal, a blanket, crossword puzzle. There's a bunch of items that go in there that when that care package shows up anonymously on their doorstep, or through a visit in the hospital, it lets them know that they're not alone, that they're being prayed for, and um, they have a God that loves them when they go through this. And then once that care package goes out, then we send cards of hope. Again, on our website, philsfriends.org, there are card templates. So they have a little joke because we know that laughter is good for the soul when you're going through a difficult time. There's a prayer and a Bible verse, and then people sign their first name and their age, and those cards then go consistently for a year. And then we'll pray for people and walk alongside and really just build friends the same way that the Lord is our friend. You know, Jesus is our friend. He walks with us through every circumstance. We want to be able to do the same thing for others and point people towards the Lord, especially as they're going through a fire or a difficult time uh, in their life. And um, so anyway, you can get involved that way, request a care package. You can volunteer, lots of opportunities on the website. And uh, always you can pray for cancer patients and their families. Well, Phil, we got about a minute and a half left here to, of our time with you, which we so appreciate you sharing. So do you think that throughout this time uh, that you were walking through that, that God was actually birthing out this ministry? It kind of reminds me of the scripture that says, this sickness is not unto death, but unto the glory of God. Do you feel that's kind of what God was doing? He allowed you to walk through that so now you can go back and touch the people at the point of their need? He definitely did allow this to happen in my life. And I'm so grateful that he did. You know, I was 22 and 23 when I went through stage four cancer. I'm 43, now going to be 44 soon. And I have my wife, Carrie, of 18 years, uh, my boys, Graham, who's 11, and Hudson, who's nine. And so life never happens on our timing. But God's timing is always perfect. And every gift, you know, comes from the Lord. And so I want to use this time. Every breath that he breathes into us is a gift. I thought about this morning when I woke up. Uh, it's not us. It's not us controlling these circumstances. It's about his will and us being involved in where he is. And once we see where he's involved, I'd encourage every listener today to get involved with what he has because God works miracles through those situations. Just as I'm a, a living, walking miracle, we've seen that happen in countless lives of other people. And uh, I'm so grateful for what the Lord has planned for us. They certainly are good plans. Well, Phil, you are definitely an inspiration. 
Uh, we so appreciate you stopping by here on Unscripted Faith, and we pray God's blessing upon you and your endeavor and your ministry as you continue to move forward with hope. Thank you. Look forward to hopefully meeting you all in person someday soon. <laughs> hopefully so. That would be wonderful. That was so good. So wonderful. So good. Well, listen, when we come back, we're going to share our final thoughts on what it means to be resilient, how you and I can see the good in various trials that we may face. We're back in just 60 seconds. God is doing a new thing. Be ready for it. With your best gift today, request Prophetic Reset, a powerful resource by prophetic leader and pastor Joshua Giles. You'll discover a 40-day journey unlike any other, one that will reposition you under God's powerful anointing, deepen your relationship with Him, and propel you forward. Through empowering scriptures, biblical insights, and prophetic tips, you'll discover how to reactivate your spiritual gifts and faith, release the old to seek Him anew, rest your mind in His counsel, and hear His wisdom for your next season. Even more, you'll witness His Word manifest in your life and return to His promises for you. Ask for Prophetic Reset when you give in support of Cornerstone Television today. Every gift helps us to spread the gospel through Christian programming. Call 888-665-4483 or give online at ctvn.org slash donate. Well, this has been such a great time. And if you're just tuning in with us, you didn't tune in too late because I really believe that there are people that are walking through things right now, Angela, that uh, are in storms, trials. You take a look at Donna, you know, what God's doing in and through her life. And, you know, I mean, you're talking about losing everything where now you're thankful for having a Christmas tree. Yes. You know, she said, I'm just yes. glad somebody brought me a Christmas tree. And then you take a look at Phil's life and how he was saying, I thought something really profound. He went through all of that stuff yes. and he said, I am so glad I went through that. Now, I don't know many people yeah. in the faith to say, sign me up for stage four, <laughs> cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma, yeah. hallelujah. But you know what? God works all things together for his yes. good. Has there ever been a time in your life yeah. that you were walking through something that was oh. unexpected, a misfortune, a trial, or whatever it might have been, and when you came out the other side, you look back and said, wow, God, this is what you're doing. And now you say that scripture, this yes. is good, the Lord's work and it's yes. marvelous in my eyes. Oh my goodness, so many times, Jay, you know, I can think about college or as a young adult or even now currently, there have been so many moments where, you know, one of the things I thought I was going to be a model. I was went to this thing and I was supposed to go to New York and, and live there. And uh, my dad said no, which was right because I was 15 years old, you know, and that was yeah. a, but that was a devastating moment for sure. me as a young girl. But fast forward as I was in ministry, and I was counseling young ladies who had opportunities. And because I had lived in the world of modeling, but didn't go to New York and all of that, I realized there were some like really corrupt things that take place there. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to speak into those spaces and realize what God had spared me from. Mm -hmm. And like, if I had gone down that path, I wouldn't be here today. And who yeah. knows where my life would be, right? But God. but God, there are yeah. so many moments within our lives, whether they're beautiful moments that seem like they're going to work out wonderfully or they're horrible. No matter what it looks like, God will turn it all for your good. He is a good father who gives good gifts. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.